Be sure you download the note card that goes along with this sermon, and you can print it out, and you can follow along. Fill it in as you follow the sermon. If you like this sermon, want to see more like this, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. Also, hit the bell notification so you'll be notified when other new content is added to this site. We try to add sermons as often as we can. We'll try to add some Bible question and answers that we've done before in the past. Other things we may be adding to this. If you have questions, leave them in the comments below. If you'd like to follow us on social media, there are links to our social media accounts in the video description below. Now, let's jump into the sermon. Today's reading from God's Word is found in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians, chapter 6. Once you get to Ephesians, chapter 6, drop down, if you will, to verse 10. Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13. As Christian soldiers engaged in battle for the souls of men, we must acknowledge that we are facing a most formidable adversary. Satan our enemy in this spiritual war affair pulls no punches, so to speak, in his efforts to defeat us. In fact, Paul tells us that we must be strong in our faith and put on the whole armor of God so that we may be able to stand firmly against the many schemes of the devil. These schemes are what makes Satan so formidable. His cunning as an adversary and seeks to attack us in ways that will make his job easier. He will seek to place roadblocks in our way that will make us easier prey to attack and destroy. This is a popular practice tactic in war. One side might block a road to impede the progress of their enemies. And they might do so in hopes of pushing them in a direction in which a trap has been laid. Because God's wisdom is pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy, we have the ability to possess these things in our life. But Satan doesn't want that. He wants to do nothing but hinder our growth in God's wisdom. He wants us to be hindered in our bearing of good fruit in our lives because of God's wisdom. He seeks instead to send us in the way of the fools of this world who seek after things other than God's wisdom. He does this because he recognizes that our obtaining of God's wisdom is bad news for his plans. And though God's wisdom, through God's wisdom, we are able to better battle and defeat him in this warfare. Of course, Satan doesn't want us to be strong warriors for the Lord. Thus, he seeks to weaken us through a lack of godly wisdom. So how does Satan do such a thing? How does Satan hinder us in our pursuit of godly wisdom? Let's take a few minutes to consider very practical ways in which Satan will try to set up roadblocks in this life that will stop us from becoming wide with wisdom that is from above. Just as Satan has a plan of attack, we can also devise a 
a plan to defend ourselves against his attacks by knowing just how he might come at us with temptation and struggles. And thus, in this lesson, we want to look at four ways Satan hinders our pursuit of godly wisdom. Let's consider these four ways. Number one, Satan causes us to not care about pursuing God's wisdom. The easiest roadblock that Satan can put in our way is to cause us to simply not care enough to pursue God's wisdom. If he can plant seeds of apathy in our hearts to where we don't see the need or have the desire to pursue God's wisdom, then Satan has accomplished his goal. Practically speaking, what might this look like? I think this might look like a couple of the churches that Jesus writes to through John in Revelation 3. Consider, if you will, for a few minutes, the churches of Sardis and Laodicea. The church in Sardis is said to be alive, but in reality, the Lord saw them as dead. They seemed to be a church that was doing nothing but going through the motions in their service to God. They cared not to give a strong effort, but instead just floated along. Much of the same could be said about the church in Laodicea. They were neither on fire for the Lord or cold in their service to God. Instead, they saw themselves as in need of nothing. They had no need to grow and seek the things of God. Satan had strong roadblocks set up in these churches, and he seeks to set the same things up in our life. Thus, growth in faith demands great efforts. If you'll notice Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 9, where Paul says, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. And then in 2 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 5, Peter says, If he did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Brethren, our faith is not passive. Any growth that comes in our faith is not passive, but it requires great effort. Furthermore, it wouldn't make sense for a person who lacks conviction or belief in the need to pursue God's wisdom to give great effort or really any effort to pursue it. We pursue those things that we see as beneficial, and Satan would love nothing more than to convince us that God's wisdom isn't worth the effort to pursue. We must rise above and not allow that roadblock to hinder our pursuit. Number two, Satan distracts us from our pursuit of God's wisdom with other things. Roadblock of apathy, maybe? It might not be that Satan is able to set that roadblock of apathy before us. Instead, it might be that we recognize the need to pursue wisdom, but Satan sets before us the roadblock of having a bunch of other things that our time is taken up pursuing. You see, life, this life, is full of blessing, the blessings of God. He is so gracious to us allows us to enjoy so many blessings. However, Satan would love to turn the blessings given to us by God into his own weapons of destruction. He wants to cause us to 
uh, give too much attention to pursuing these things when we ought to have our priorities in order seeking God, His will, His wisdom. He would love for us to be like the former kingdom worker of Demas who abandoned Paul and instead pursued those things of the world that he loved more. Second Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 10 Paul says, For Demas in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Satan tries to cause us to pursue the sinful and not love the wisdom of God enough to pursue it. 1 John Chapter 2 and verse 15 tells us, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eye, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. But it might be that he takes an easier angle of attack by simply gutting us to give more time to things of this world that aren't bad in and of themselves. It might be that we give all of our attention to things of our family and we don't give time to godly pursuits. It might be our job that takes up all of our time. Maybe it's hobbies, interests, wealth, or anything else that might eat up all of our time. Any number of things of this world that are good and wholesome can quickly become idols that eat up our time, effort, and energy to the point that we don't have anything to offer to the pursuit of God. And you'll notice in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, where Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on the earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one, he says, can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, he says, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body, what you will put on it is not your life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the buds of the air. They neither soil, sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you being anxious can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, for they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, here's a conclusion. Find out what it's there for. Do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first, here it is, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In other words, we need to keep first things first and keep everything in its place. Seeking God, His will and wisdom comes first before all other things. What good will it be if we focus only on our families, hobbies, wealth, or any number of things, yet we fail to seek God or have His wisdom that shows us how we can most enjoy these things? What good is it if we gain the whole world but remain as the fool without God's wisdom? 
Satan would love for this to be our circumstances, but we must stay strong and overcome this devilish roadblock in our pursuit of God's wisdom. Number three, Satan allows us to think that we are wise enough on our own. Now, going back to the church at Laodicea a few minutes, go to Revelation chapter 3 and drop down to verse 14, where Jesus writes this, To the angel of the church at Laodicea write, The words of Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation, I know your works. He said, You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you are either cold or hot, so that because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing, here's what Jesus saw, you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. He said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich in white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, Jesus says. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, watch this, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It might also be said of that church that while they might have been lukewarm and apathetic, it might have been fueled by their belief that they were without need from God. This was a church that had been abundantly blessed. What need had they for God, they thought? Satan would love to plant seeds of these kinds of thoughts into our heads these seeds would grow into major roadblocks. He would love to have these in our head that would seek to inhibit us from seeking God's wisdom. These roadblocks come before us and get us to question why we would need to seek God's wisdom when we seem to be doing so well on our own. There are a couple of really big issues with this type of thinking. One, we are failing to give God the credit. That's the first issue. James chapter 1 and verse 17. We have to remember every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God's blessing are a result of His goodness and loving kindness and not a product or a product of our own being. Secondly, we probably wouldn't want to really see where we would be if we only relied on our own wisdom. It's God's Word and His wisdom that lights our way, Psalm 119 and verse 105. Psalm 40 and verse 1, he says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and, I, and He heard my cry. He drew near me, He drew me up and from a pit of destruction out of the mire of the bog and set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, song of praise, he says, to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in a God. He allows us to be successful through the things he provides in his wisdom. It would be much more accurate to describe where we would be on our own in terms of being blind, leading the blind, ending up in the ditch, as Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 15 and in verse 14. He gets us then to look for God's wisdom in the minds of men. That's the final satanic roadblock in our pursuit of godly wisdom is that of Satan causing us to look for God's wisdom in the minds of men. It might be that we see the need of pursuing and obtaining godly wisdom, so we dig to 
begin to dig into God's Word. And we also look out those who teach and preach that it can help us to give us a sense of, of God and God is writing to us. Nehemiah 8 is a good chapter to read. All the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded. Then Ezra assembles all the priests and he reads to the people from the law. And you'll notice as the law was being read, the respect that the people showed by standing up. The Levites, they calmed all the people and said, be quiet for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And so the people were anxious to hear the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 asks us, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of good news, the good news. These are good things to do. But where we get ourselves in trouble and come up against a satanic roadblock is when we don't demand that those teaching us actually teach what is in the Bible, a various serious roadblock. But it isn't this exactly what hinders so many people. That's what hinders them from knowing God's Word. So many big-name preachers such as Joel Osteen, Joyce Myers, T.D. Jakes, Benny Hinn, Jimmy Swaggart, and the like, have such huge followings that come to them for God's Word, but they receive anything and everything but it. You know, you all know my love for the Babylon, uh, Babylon Bee, a religious satire website. You ought to go there sometime and read some of that. Recently, they posted an article depicting Joel Osteen diving off the stage because he spotted someone in attendance opening up his Bible while preaching a sermon entitled, Claiming Your Comfort Zone. Pastor Joel Osteen made a divine save from Luke, uh, Lakewood's church's stage Sunday, it says, to prevent a man in the front row from opening his Bible and checking the validity of the popular pastor's word sources confirmed. The incident reportedly occurred after Osteen made a claim that the pul from the pulpit that the power to speak prosperity into existence is inside each one of us, causing a visitor in, in the front row to furrow his brow and begin leafing through his Bible to find any kind of proof for Osteen's claim. The televangelist's ears perked up at the unusual, unfamiliar sound, and he sprang into action shouting, No! and making an amazing 20-foot long dive into the crowd before snatching the Bible out of the man's hand at the last possible moment. And this is according to a witness at the BabylonianB.com slash news slash Joel Olstein dives off stage prevents man from opening Bible. So behind satire is often at least a little, if not much, truth, and that's exactly what we see in that piece from the Babylonian Bee. In truth, it is that if more people actually would open up their Bibles and consider the work spoken to them, the words, then these individuals wouldn't have near the following they currently do. But really the truth is that men leading others away from God is nothing new. False teachers have been leading others astray for thousands of years. Specifically in the New Testament times, we can find instances where groups of people were led away from God by the false words of others. Paul and Peter both addressed and warned their readers of the dangers of false teacher. Paul warns Timothy in both his letters to his preaching 
uh, prodigy about the false teachers who would rise up and lead disciples away. 1 Timothy 4 and 2 Timothy 3. Peter then also gives strong warning against false teachers. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even desiring the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Satan obviously wants these false teachers to lead as many away as possible so what needs to be done? It is our responsibility to hold teachers and preachers to the high standard of only teaching and preaching what is of the mind of God. We must be like the Bereans of Acts chapter 17, verse 11. We must search the scriptures daily to see what we're being taught is so. In so doing, this roadblock that Satan tries to set before us will not hinder us from pursuing God's wisdom in this life. Satan is never resting in his desire for us to fall short of God's glory in this life. If he can make his job easier through putting roadblocks in our way, then he will certainly use that tactic if necessary. May we be strong in our resolve to not allow our pursuit of God's wisdom to be thrown off course by Satan's roadblocks. May we pursue and lay a hold of God's wisdom so that we might be strong disciples and warriors in the battle for the souls of men. Now be sure to download the note card for this lesson and tell others where you heard this lesson or saw this lesson. Now, the Bible reveals to us what we must do to be saved. That question was asked by the Philippian jailer in the first century. We find that in Acts chapter 16 where he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The gospel must be heard. You shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. So we need to hear the gospel to be set free. The gospel must be believed. John 20 and verse 30, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in his book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And then sins must be repented of. Acts 16 verse 31 uh, 33 rather, we find that he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, a sign of repentance on the jailer's part. Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you, no, Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Acts 17, 30, the time of this ignorance God overlooked now commands all men everywhere to repent. Then Jesus Christ must be confessed with the mouth the Lord Jesus, believing on heart that he raised him from the dead, then will be saved, Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us. For with the heart, man believed to righteousness, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And then there must be scriptural baptism. Acts 22, 16, Saul was to ask, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We find in Colossians 2, 12, having been buried with him in baptism, see baptism and burial, in which you were raised coming up out of the water with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses. Baptism which corresponds to this now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as newborn babes, we must desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 2. And here in, in 2 Peter Chapter 1 and verse 3, there's that list for this very reason. We need to supplement our faith with virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, steadfastness, steadfastness, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, love. If these qualities are yours,
and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But watch this next verse. Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, see what it's there for. Conclusion, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these things, you will never fall. There's an if-then statement. If you practice these things, you'll never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then, do not fear those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you'll have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. We must obey the gospel to be saved by the Lord in heaven. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8, Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will suffer with the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. We're to purify our souls by obeying the truth with a sincere love of the brethren, love one another earnestly with a pure heart. Have you done this is the question. Remember Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now again, remember the note cards. Get the note cards for this lesson. Tell others about this lesson. Subscribe to this lesson so you can get a notification of when new lessons are added to this site, be it YouTube, Rumble, Facebook, or the 10 audio podcast sites that these messages are available. Till next time, Bob's your uncle. Cheerio, friends. Now, thank you for joining us on YouTube here by watching this lesson. Also, remember these lessons are archived at rumble.com slash user and then capital SPH lowercase church. You'll find the archives of these lessons. If they're not on YouTube, then go there if you can't find them on YouTube. Remember our service here at the Spring Hill Church of Christ meeting at 405 Butler Street, Spring Hill, Louisiana, three quarters of a mile south from the land of opportunity or Arkansas. You'll find us on Butler Street. Come on the big motorway coming out of Arkansas. Turn left on Butler Street. There is a Bellatini Brookshire's or whatever, I can't remember the name of it right now, grocery store across from us, a real estate office next to us, but we're in the big building there, Spring Hill Church of Christ. We meet Sunday morning Bible study, 935, Sunday worship service, 1045, pre-evening, six o'clock in the evening is evening time starts normally. So we're two hours before that, so it's pre-evening, 4 p.m., Wednesday evening, 6.30 p.m. Come join us in person. Watch us online. Also, the audio is available on my website. Watch the unusual spelling of Michael. It's M-I-K-E-A-L-R, middle initial, Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S, not Hughes or Hughes, but Hughes.com. Until next time, Bob's your uncle. Cheerio.